Jack the Ripper's Diary. Jack the Ripper is the famous moniker that was given to the serial killer who terrorized the city of London, England in 1888. The murders attributed to Jack the Ripper involved prostitutes. The killer was known for mutilating his victims in such a way that many assumed the Ripper possessed an extensive understanding of the human anatomy. Jack the Ripper is believed to have been responsible for up to 11 murders. However, most experts conclude the killer to be responsible for five murders, although many feel a strong case can be made for six. The murders all took place August through November of 1888 in the Whitechapel district found in the seedy slums of London's East End. The Ripper was never captured. Next to his final victim, investigators found a diary left by Jack the Ripper. The discovery was never revealed. Until now. The History Before divulging the diary, it's important to go over the most essential details pertaining to the Jack the Ripper case. The following information focuses on the victims, where they were found, the last time they were seen, eyewitness testimony, and clues relating to the vicious murders. The Victims Martha Tabram Body discovered August 7th, 1888 There is debate as to whether or not Martha Tabram is a Jack the Ripper victim. Martha Tabram was found on her back in a pool of blood. She was viciously attacked and stabbed 39 times. The savage stab wounds were found throughout her stomach, chest, throat, and vagina. The closeness of both the site and date of the subsequent Ripper murders led investigating officers at the time to believe that Tabram was a victim of Jack the Ripper. Others disagree, citing the fact that her throat was not sliced, as were the following Ripper victims. A fellow prostitute, Mary Ann Connolly, was the last person to report seeing Martha Tabram that night. Connolly stated that the two had been drinking together. According to Connolly, the prostitute spent time with two soldiers. After sharing several drinks, Connolly disclosed that she and the soldier she fancied broke off from the others and stepped into Angel Alley while Tabram and her soldier companion headed toward George Yard. That was the last known sighting of Martha Tabram. The soldiers in question were never identified. The Victims Mary Nichols Body discovered August 31st, 1888 Mary Nichols is believed by the majority of experts to be the first victim of Jack the Ripper. She was found on a thin road known as Buck's Row. Her throat was sliced so deep that she was nearly decapitated. Her skirt was pulled up practically over her waist. Her vagina had been stabbed multiple times and her stomach had been ripped open. That night, she spent time at the Frying Pan Pub. She then requested a room at Wilmot's lodging house, but was turned away for lack of funds. The last person to report seeing Mary Nichols that fateful night was Emily Holland. Mary was reportedly quite inebriated and Emily Holland offered to pay for her room at Wilmot's. Mary refused, implying that she could earn enough to pay for a room herself. She was never seen alive again. The Victims Annie Chapman Body discovered September 8, 1888 Annie Chapman's body was found near a doorway on Hanbury Street. 
Her throat was penetrated by two jagged slices. Her abdomen had been slashed open. Her small intestines had been pulled from her abdomen and placed on her shoulder. Piles of flesh from her stomach were found next to the victim. Portions of her womb, bladder, and vagina were missing. Annie Chapman reportedly had an altercation with another woman in a pub a few days before her final night, which left her battered and bruised. The day before her death, Chapman's friend, Amelia Palmer, said she encountered an extremely ill Annie Chapman. Chapman stated that she was too ill to do anything, but then went on to declare that I must pull myself together and get some money, or I shall have no lodgings. The Victims Elizabeth Long Liz Stride Body Discovered September 30th, 1888 Elizabeth Stride's body was found in Dutfield's yard just off of Burner Street. She is the first of two Jack the Ripper victims on the same night, commonly referred to as the Double Event. Her throat had been deeply sliced, severing her corroded artery and cutting her trachea in two. The body was still warm when discovered. Many believe that the Ripper had been interrupted before having a chance to proceed with mutilating the body. It is speculated that Jack the Ripper was not satisfied with this slaying, thus the killer immediately began to seek out another victim on the very same night. A man named Israel Schwartz claims to have seen Elizabeth Stride a mere 30 minutes prior to her body being found. As Israel Schwartz turned onto Burner Street, he says he saw Elizabeth Stride standing near the gateway of Dutfield's yard. He witnessed a short man with a full face and broad shoulders approach the woman. He said the short man had an altercation with the woman and threw her to the ground. While this was happening, Schwartz claims to have seen a taller man standing in the shadows. He reported the man was wearing a dark overcoat and a black hat. Schwartz crossed the street to avoid the fracas, assuming it was a domestic violence situation and did not want to get involved. As he walked away from the altercation, he claims that the taller man stepped out of the shadows and started following him. Scared that he may be in danger, Schwartz ran away. The Victims Catherine Eddowes Body Discovered September 30th, 1888 Catherine Eddowes' body was found in Mitre Square, approximately half a mile west of Burner Street. She was found in a puddle of her own blood, with her skirt tossed up over her waist. Her body was brutalized. Her throat was slit, ear to ear. Her stomach had been sliced open and some of her organs stabbed. Her intestines were pulled out and placed on her shoulder. One of her kidneys had been removed along with her uterus. Her face had been butchered. Her nose had been cut off. There were slash marks across her cheeks and eyes. Only 15 minutes before the body was found, Three men claim to have seen Catherine Eddowes walking with a man near Mitre Square. Many investigators were puzzled as to how Jack the Ripper could commit such an atrocity and depart Mitre Square without being spotted. Surely the killer would be covered in blood and thus would stand out. A bloody apron was found along Golston Street later that night. At a brisk pace, Golston Street is approximately 10 minutes from the murder site. The apron is believed to have belonged to Catherine Eddowes, and apparently the Ripper used it to wipe off his knife. There was graffito discovered near the apron that read, 
The Jews are the men that will not be blamed for nothing. Some believe the graffito to be a message left by Jack the Ripper. The Victims Mary Jane Kelly Body discovered November 9th, 1888 Jack the Ripper's final victim was found mutilated in a room at 13 Miller's Court off Dorset Street. Her throat was sliced to her vertebrae. Her face was chopped up beyond recognition with ears, nose, and all facial features having been removed. She had been eviscerated. Her abdomen was emptied of its organs. Her uterus, kidneys, and breasts had been removed and placed by her mangled head. Her thighs were stripped to the bone. Piles of the flesh were stacked on the floor and bedside table. Her heart was missing. Inspector Walter Drew was quoted as saying the following upon reflecting on what he witnessed that day. As my thoughts go back to Miller's Court and what happened there, the old nausea, indignation, and horror overwhelm me still. My mental picture of it remains as shockingly clear as though it were but yesterday. No savage could have been more barbaric. No wild animal could have done anything so horrifying. The Letters Dear Boss An intriguing aspect of the Jack the Ripper case was a series of taunting notes received from a person announcing themselves as Jack the Ripper. The Dear Boss letter was received by the Central News Agency on September 27th. They immediately forwarded the letter to Scotland Yard. Early in the Jack the Ripper investigation, the police had a primary suspect named John Pizer, also known as Leather Apron. Pizer was arrested but subsequently released due to having alibis on the nights of the murders. It was also speculated that due to his apparent knowledge of human anatomy, Jack the Ripper may be a doctor. Leather Apron and the Doctor Theory are both referenced in the Dear Boss letter. The letter reads as follows. Dear Boss, I keep on hearing the police have caught me, but they won't fix me just yet. I have laughed when they look so clever and talk about being on the right track. That joke about Leather Apron gave me real fits. I am down on whores and shan't quit ripping them till I do get buckled. Grand work the last job was. I gave the lady no time to squeal. How can they catch me now? I love my work and want to start again. You will soon hear of me with my funny little games. I saved some of the proper red stuff in a ginger beer bottle over the last job to write with, but it went thick like glue and I can't use it. Red ink is fit enough, I hope. Ha ha. The next job I do, I shall clip the lady's ears off and send to the police officers just for jolly, wouldn't you? Keep this letter back till I do a bit more work, then give it out straight. My knife's so nice and sharp, I want to get to work right away, if I get a chance. Good luck. Yours truly, Jack the Ripper. Don't mind me giving the trade name. Wasn't good enough to post this before I got all the red ink off my hands, curse it. No luck yet. They say I'm a doctor now. Ha ha. The Letters Saucy Jack Another letter that investigators had taken notice of was a postcard referred to as Saucy Jack. The letter references the double event. The postcard reads 
as follows. I was not cotting, dear old boss, when I gave you the tip. You'll hear about Saucy Jack's work tomorrow. Double event this time. Number one squealed a bit. Couldn't finish straight off. Had no time to get ears off for police. Thanks for keeping last letter back till I got to work again. Jack the Ripper. The Letters from Hell. George Lusk and several other businessmen in the region created the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee, of which George Lusk was elected chairman. Their hope was to assist the police with apprehending Jack the Ripper. The From Hell letter was sent to George Lusk. The letter was accompanied by a box that housed half of a preserved human kidney. Examiners concluded that the kidney was indeed that of a human. The letter reads as follows. From Hell, Mr. Lusk, sorry. I send you half the kidney I took from one woman, preserved it for you. The other piece I fried and ate. It was very nice. I may send you the bloody knife that took it out if you only wait a while longer. Signed, Catch Me When You Can, Mr. Lusk. The Diary When investigators discovered the body of Jack the Ripper's final victim, Mary Jane Kelly, in a room at 13 Miller's Court, it was not only her organs and flesh that they found laid out next to the body. They also found a small diary. The diary was written in Mary Jane Kelly's blood. The diary reads as follows. Hello, lads. Consider yourselves conquered, for I shall not be resuming my artistry within your lovely district of Whitechapel. The kitchen is getting too hot. I'll be taking my talents elsewhere now. This was my final performance. Did you enjoy? I couldn't leave you all the spoils, so I took her heart for my own. I don't want to leave you with the impression that I have no gentlemanly qualities. Thus I'll shine a bright light on the case for all of you who seem to be feeling around in the dark. This is not my first go-around. I've been doing this for quite some time. Almost been nabbed a time or two. But I'm wiser about my recreation than I previously was. Attention and my pastime don't mix, so I never stay in one region for long. Whitechapel has been such a good time. I've stayed here much longer than is typical for me. Couldn't help myself with all the dregs, whores, and dark places to do my deeds. I scout locations before I indulge. Not sensible to begin the good fun blind. I also follow my prey for hours before I make my move. Don't like no surprises in my line of work. The first in Whitechapel was August 7th, 1888. Seems some of you weren't sure if this was one of mine. I can confirm. Wasn't planning on ripping this night. I was still getting a lay of the land, but the whore caught my eye. Saw the girl with another whore. They were walking with two soldiers. First one split off. She led her soldier into Angel Alley. I let them go and followed the others. She and her soldier boy turned down George Yard. I hid in the shadows and watched as the filthy whore performed orally on the soldier. After the soldier left, the whore stayed in the shadows too long. Too perfect for me to pass up. Didn't have me proper tools this night. Had to use the trusty pocket knife. Not as quick or handy, but it did the job good. Not sharp enough to slice, but good for many stabs, as you saw. August 31st, 1888, was my next performance. 
a night of two substantial fires in town, of which I assure you I had no part in. So many went off to enjoy the display that the streets were especially quiet. I followed this one for much of the night. She spent a good amount of time at the frying pan pub, finishing off more than a few. Good and drunk makes my job easier. I followed her waiting for an opening, but had no luck, and she found success in making it to lodging. Was about to turn my attention elsewhere until she was turned away for not having the fourpence necessary for a bed. I followed in the darkness, watched her chat with a girl on Brick Lane who offered to pay for her lodging, but lucky for me, she refused. Stubborn to pay her own way, I suppose. When she was finally alone, I approached. She was happy to see me, thinking I'd pay for the services she offered. She led me to Buck's Row, quiet and dark. My blade was fast. She hadn't time to make a peep. Had enough time to rip this one open. Heard some stirring at the end of the throughway, or I'd have done more. Couldn't wait long to do it again. September 8th was the next date. This one was a sickly bird. She was busy that night earning a pretty penny. She was a talkative one. Spoke of her talent being crocheting. Asked me if I had any talents. I told her she was about to experience mine. She got a nice chuckle out of that, assuming I was speaking of giving her a good stitch. She went on to tell me about the physical quarrel she had with a fellow lady at her lodging house, pointing out the bruises on her face from the altercation. I told her that was nothing compared to what I was about to do. By her expression, she wasn't sure if I was serious or not. Immaterial as I shut her up well and good with a flash of my blade. We were under the shroud of darkness from a doorway. Streets were quiet at the time of night. I had time to do my good work. Even kept a few parts for myself. Tricky night was September 30th. You like to call it the double event. And a double event it surely was. The first girl was a mistake. Should have let her go and moved on to another. I had staked her out and decided to make my move once she took position near the gateway of Dutfield's yard. It was then that the two men rounded the corner of Burner Street. I stepped back into the shadows. The first man was short and plump. He appeared to be a drunkard and propositioned the whore. I couldn't make out what she said that made him angry but he grabbed her and threw her to the ground. The second man was heavily bearded. He observed the quarrel for a moment and then walked away. I decided to do the same and followed behind the bearded man. I'd have to find a new whore to do my dirty work on. When I heard the woman yell out an obscenity, I turned around. The plump man slurred out something derogatory and left. Suddenly, the street was quiet again, so I refocused on the original mark. I approached her and asked if she was injured. She insisted that she was fine. I asked her if she felt well enough to service me. She was more than willing and led me into Dutfield's yard, which was nearly pitch black. I had just sliced through the soft flesh of her throat, when I heard the clomping steps of a horse and carriage. I stood silently waiting for the carriage to pass, but was unlucky as it turned toward me. The horse spooked and refused to approach in my direction. The driver jumped from the carriage and struck a match as he investigated the source of the horse's apprehension. I lay the whore on the ground and quietly stepped back into the cover of darkness, hoping he wouldn't notice the body. The match lit up the area more than I anticipated. The whore's body was clear to see. If the man were to start screaming bloody murder, a mob would come running 
and I'd have to try my best to hack my way through them. The odds wouldn't be in my favor. I was lucky when he rushed into a nearby club for assistance. It gave me just enough time to make my escape. I couldn't leave the night at that now, could I? Of course not. Another whore would be on the menu tonight. I ventured no more than a half mile away, near Mitre Square, and found another whore ripe for the taking. I propositioned her and we began walking to a secluded area. I almost called off the endeavor when three men passed by. They looked our way, but I had my head down so as not to be seen well. A whore walking with a man is nothing new in these parts, so I doubt they gave us much thought. Once alone, I introduced the whore to my knife. It was quiet. There was a good echo in that area for me to hear others coming from a distance. I didn't feel rushed, and took the time to slice her up nice-like. It was a good while before a man stumbled upon her remains. I was watching from a distance, you see. Not often I get to see reactions to my handiwork. The first man panicked and rushed to Curly and Tongue's warehouse, and returned with a night watchman. I chuckled aloud as the watchman practically lost his breath blowing on his whistle. Much speculation as to how I could slay the whore without her letting out a squeal. It's rather simple. I'm good with my blade. As for how I managed to escape Mitre Square without being seen, well, there are plenty of dark passages to hide in until there is a clear moment. And who says I was on the street the entire time? Many dwellings for me to find my way into. As for the bloody apron found on Golston Street, why yes, I did wipe my blade on that apron, but I left it next to the body. I can only surmise that a dog picked it up and carried it away, finally dropping it at the location it was found. As for the graffito on the wall, not my doing. And let me lay to rest the conjecture pertaining to whether or not I am blood-covered when I finish my task. I'm well versed in which way to expect the blood to spurt, and in case one was unaware, blood wipes off skin rather easily, but still it can be a messy business. Removing my overcoat before beginning the procedure and putting it on afterward masks the majority of spatter. I also wear dark clothing. Not only does this assist me in hiding within the shadows, but blood doesn't show up as well on black. Also, those letters you received were amusing, but they were not written by me. Or were they? I suppose you'll never know for sure. And this all leads us to this fateful night, November 9th, a nice night for a butchering. You may be wondering why no fancy work from your favorite ripper in October. I was away preparing my journey for my next location. Can't stay in Whitechapel any longer and still have my fun. Did you miss me? Wanted to leave you something nice to remember me by. Catch me when you can. Ha <laughs> ha. Jack the Ripper. The diary ends at that point. Investigators found themselves in a precarious position. They were already under an enormous amount of pressure to catch the killer and bring him to justice and the public was becoming restless. If they made Jack the Ripper's diary public, it would only cause further embarrassment. As it was, the media was constantly bombarding them with intense criticism, mocking them with satirical cartoons and scornful articles. It was officially decided that making Jack the Ripper's diary public would only open them up to more ridicule. They felt the shrewder decision 
would be to keep the diary hushed. If Jack the Ripper remained true to his word, the killings would stop, things would settle down, and hopefully this would eventually blow over. In the aftermath of the murders, Whitechapel became a pressure cooker of suspicion, paranoia, and fear waiting to explode, but slowly simmered as Jack the Ripper seemed to have kept his word. A heavy police presence was intentionally maintained in Whitechapel for the next year to help calm the public. There were other murders in the area that the press was eager to pin on Jack the Ripper, but none of the murders matched the mutilating moniker of the brutal Whitechapel murderer and were officially dismissed as being unrelated. Investigators officially closed the Jack the Ripper file in 1892.